Well, we continue our study this morning in the book of Hebrews. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to take them and find the book of Hebrews in the New Testament at chapter 2. We're going to read just a few verses in the book of Hebrews at chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, we'll begin reading at verse 1, and we'll conclude at verse 4 as we think along uh, this topic of the danger of drifting. If you would stand, please, in honor of the reading of God's Word this night together, this morning, not night. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to His will. And so ends the reading of God's holy word. May I pray. And our Father, may Your word be our rule, Your spirit our teacher, and Your greater glory our supreme concern. In Christ we pray. Amen. Please be seated. It's no surprise to us today that we are living in a time in which the stock value of truth doesn't count for much. People aren't so concerned with truth. It's all about feelings today. That's what seems to matter and so even in churches across this land, they don't want to get hung up on matters of doctrine or truth. We just want to feel good and love each other. Now that may sound attractive, but such an attitude is ultimately a recipe for disaster. For what we believe about Jesus Christ is the most important thing, determining both our eternal destiny as well as our usefulness to God in this world. F. F. Bruce, in his commentary, writes, the truth and teaching of the gospel must not be held lightly they are of supreme moment. They are matters of life and death and must be cherished and obeyed at all cost. The danger of drifting away from them and so losing them cannot be treated too gravely. Well, it is to this matter that the writer of Hebrews now turns in chapter 2 at verse 1, and this is but the first of five major warnings in the book of Hebrews, all of which deal with the danger of falling away from faith in Christ and thus from salvation itself. And one of the chief themes in the book of Hebrews is do not fall away. Don't go back. And these Hebrew Christians were under the threat of persecution, not only from without, but even from troubles within. And so the writer, the preacher to the book of Hebrews warns them not to renounce Jesus Christ. And the writer focuses then here on the danger of drifting away from the message of salvation that they had heard. 
And the word that he uses here of drifting away is a term describing a ship at sail that has drifted off course, or perhaps even a ship in the harbor that has slipped its moorings. Richard Phillips himself writes, in other contexts, this nautical term is used to describe something that slips from our minds, or even a ring that slips off a finger. One of the key ideas here is that this drifting away is something that happens largely unnoticed. While it is happening, the changes are imperceptible and noticeable. Only later do its consequences become clear. This is a grave danger against which we must respond with the most careful attention. Growing up on the northeast coast of Florida, where the currents are a little different than typically that in the Gulf area, uh, the waves are, are a little more potent and bigger. Uh, the currents, the rip currents, are more subtle yet more dangerous at many times. And it's not uncommon in the summer months as vacationers come down to constantly seeing people having to be rescued. It could be a lazy day, the sun shining, the breeze just barely blowing, and the water almost calm with some swells occurring and you float on that uh, float, and you're just laid back, just enjoying the beauty of God's world. And, and if you aren't careful and aren't paying attention, in a matter of literally moments, you can be several hundred yards out away from the shore or hundreds of yards away from where your party may be. And oftentimes, you'll find people panic then, fall off the float. Now they're in shark area of waters, and not only that, other matters as well. They didn't notice what was occurring. There was a current pulling them out, dragging them off the whole while. Well, friend, there is a current to this present evil age, pulling strongly out from the safe harbor of salvation in Jesus Christ. And we do not have to actively betray Jesus or renounce our faith simply by not paying attention, by becoming preoccupied with the sights and sounds of this world, we can easily be drawn out until we are swept away from the current with Christ. I don't know if you realize that. Do you realize that if you do not pay attention to your spiritual condition, it will deteriorate on its own? Do you realize that given the corrupt nature of this world and of your own heart, that naturally you will become dull and deadened spiritually, steadily giving in, falling for the lies of this evil age? without giving heed to the spiritual resources that God provides, your heart will naturally revert to greed, pride, avarice, sensuality, and all sorts of malice. Those characteristics that define our natural state and sin and ultimately will lead to destruction. The writer of Hebrews confronts us then with the reality of what we call apostasy or defection. Now, to be sure, 
The Bible teaches the eternal security of all true believers in Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. And yet, it is also true that not all who give profession of faith are true believers. Remember Judas Iscariot, a disciple of Jesus Christ? Or or what of Paul's one-time companion, Demas? For instance, at the end of Colossians and Philemon, Paul adds his name to a list of close companions. But a little later on in 2 Timothy, we read these sobering words, Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me. Friend, here was a disciple of Jesus a fellow laborer with the Apostle Paul, if they could fall away, you can too. We are secure through faith in Jesus Christ. But like a good tree, true faith is revealed by its fruit said Jesus. Therefore, Peter tells us to be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure in his second letter. Paul adds, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith in 2 Corinthians. And we must therefore then persevere, and we must actively, diligently use the resources God gives us to bear fruit and thus not fall prey to drifting away. And so mindful of the danger of apostasy, the preacher in Hebrews gives the accompanying command at verse 1, therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. What we have heard, of course, is referring to the message of salvation in God's Son. And again, Richard Phillips points out yet a second nautical term in the Greek language when the writer says, pay much closer attention. He's using a term that denotes holding to a course or securing an anchor. And so the writer argues that there is a danger and there's also a remedy. To avoid drifting off course, you must hold the will of the ship in line to avoid slipping out with the current of this evil world. You must make fast the anchor of your hope in Jesus Christ. For drifting away happens on its own without any effort on our part. But staying on course is quite the opposite. Staying on course requires constant diligence. In Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis writes, we have to be continually reminded of what we believe. Neither this belief nor any other will automatically remain alive In your mind, it must be fed. And as a matter of fact, 
he goes on, if you examined a hundred people who had lost their faith in Christianity, I wonder how many of them would turn out to have been reasoned out of it by honest argument. And then he asks this poignant question, do not most people simply drift away? In the matter of our belief, as in all other matters, Christianity requires hard work. That's why the New Testament describes the life of faith as a fight, as a race, as a field in which a farmer labors heavily. That's why Paul says in a number of different places, I press on, I follow hard after, I strive, I fight. For you must understand when it comes to the past tense of our salvation, in other words, to what is already finished, what is already secured, namely the act of our justification through faith in Jesus Christ, there is no place for our works. Jesus Christ has done the work. We simply receive that salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and it's a one-time act. But when it comes to the present tense of our salvation, that which is worked out progressively that which leads to godliness and holiness in our lives, what we might call sanctification, is not a one-time act. It's an ongoing process. And that, dear friend, is extremely active. And the particular means by which God grants security and sanctification, the writer of Hebrews warns us, is to concentrate deeply and much on the gospel message, or to put it more generally, to concentrate, to review, to remember, to be reminded of God's saving revelation in Jesus Christ, or to use the nautical language, God's Word is that anchor that secures our salvation, and it is the rudder by which we safely steer the ship of our souls safely into the harbor. In other words, we must fight, we must strive to remember and organize our thoughts around the Bible's message every day of our lives. We need to remember daily about humanity's fall in sin and the corruption that remains within us. We need then to recall what the Bible teaches about God's character, His faithfulness and power, His wisdom and love. We need to be told about the holiness of God without which no one shall enter heaven. And we need to be reminded about what our offense and how it is such a sin and such an offense to a holy God. And then we must look to the cross and see God's mercy so wondrously displayed, remembering that we have been purchased as a new and holy people, never more to dwell in sin. And therefore, we need to go on daily and recall that our, our grounding of identity in God's adoption as one of His beloved children in Christ. Christ's blood that was shed to purchase us from sin and in our destiny as co-heirs with Jesus Christ and as saints called to glory 
and remembering as well not only our destiny, our ultimate calling, but we are called as pilgrims sojourning through an alien and dying world. Kevin DeYoung sums it up much more simply this way. We just simply need to pay attention to the message of God's Word. He says endurance is not a magic spell that falls upon the Christian. No, no. Endurance comes from knowing what God's Word requires. Knowing who we are according to God's Word. And knowing that God's Word lasts when all else falters and fails. So God's Word and the importance of it for us in its preaching and in its study and reading, it's like a firm anchor that holds us fast in the salvation of Jesus Christ. And it's like a compass to guide us safely to our eternal destiny called glory. And that's why the writer of Hebrews continues on reminding us of the danger of neglecting this message of salvation. You notice at verse 2, he had been rehearsing the ministry of angels to the Old Testament saints and how they had been helpful to deliver the law of God to God's people through the prophet and through Moses and others. And then he says that if that generation in the wilderness were all condemned to die in the wilderness because they rejected that message the angels took part in delivering, how much more, how should you escape a great salvation not sent by angels, but sent by none other than the Son of God Himself. If people who had received the message from angels were condemned, how much more shall be your condemnation if you neglect or drift away from the message of God's own Son. And of course, it's a rhetorical question. And the implication that the writer expects is there is no escape to neglect or to drift away from this, to move slowly, albeit from this message, and to find that you no longer love as you love, no longer obeyed as you obeyed, no longer trusted as you thought you trusted, is only to be on the broad road that leads to outer darkness. So in our, our remaining moments, I want us to imagine for just a moment, imagine a, a conversation that could occur from someone who has found themselves drifting away unnoticed to themselves until it was eternally too late and they discovered that they were on that broad road of outer darkness. So imagine Imagine you, you heard a conversation from the outer darkness and some soul who has done exactly this finds himself in the outer darkness in death. And his first reaction to this outer deep darkness is to say to himself, how did I get here? And then perhaps to cry out loud in a darkness that he can't penetrate. Am I the only one here? Is there no one else here? Only to hear a voice from across the darkness penetrate that deep, deep darkness. No, no, I am here. And so one voice says to the other, how, how did you get here? And the answer to be is, 
I didn't do anything at all. What do you mean? The message of salvation and Jesus Christ came to me. I heard it, but, but, but I didn't do anything at all. And I thought I was okay. I didn't think I need to do anything at all. I, I just neglected it and got along in life. But, but you, how, how did you get here? I didn't know anything was happening to me. The voice cried out. I just drifted here. It's as though this writer is saying to us, what do you need to do to go to hell? And the answer is you don't need to do anything at all. You say, well, we can think of people we know that are, that are like that. I mean, if they, they weren't like that, they would, they would be in here with us. The preacher in Hebrews is not speaking to those people. You didn't read or hear this letter read. If you were one of the great unwashed pagans of that world in that day, you only heard this if you were actually in a deeply committed Christian church. Friend, our greatest danger is that we simply neglect the truth of God's Word and we drift ever so slowly from it. Now, when is that likely to happen? When is that likely to occur? Let's, again, just in a few moments, think of some seasons that those kinds of things could happen without our noticing it could be as a young person, you're, you're, you're dreaming of college and preparing to move off to school and, uh, because it's the first opportunity to discover who you're really going to be. I mean, thus far, you've been who your parents have told you that you ought to be. So, so what are your priorities going to be? Well, it's interesting that that opportunity is not only about your future. That opportunity will tell you everything about your past and whether you're really Christ or not. That's a time when most think they can just go their own way. But that in itself is a confession of what one really hopes and longs for. For you see, most important is the issue of whether or not you will stay close to Christ and the faith in Him. Another potentially dangerous season of drifting or neglecting is well way beyond college and now you're in the housing market, uh, your, your family is growing, you're, you're climbing the corporate ladder, or the promotions in your work, you're building your family, and before you know it, the, the plates are, are, are tumbling, the wheels are spinning, and everything else but Jesus Christ becomes your priority. Oh, it's, it's not that you did anything. See, see that's the problem. It's that you allow things to do themselves to you. And the choices you make, the financial choices, the moral choices, what's going to be first in your life when there are so many other important things, indeed good things to be done? But the writer wants us to pause and remember we need to choose the best things. And the best thing is that relationship in Jesus Christ. Or perhaps later on in life and the kids are out of the house. 
They've graduated from university now. Uh, much of your dad has been paid. You've got some more luxury money, free spending money. The mortgage is perhaps whittled away if not paid off. And so one day you wake and you turn and you look at your spouse and say, all right, babe, it's now our time. What do you want to do? And thus, you confess that you've been living all these years wanting your time and not Christ's time. And so you make some dreadful decisions that actually display that your anchoring to Christ was some kind of mirage. The church, the gospel, the Christian life, worship, well, all of that was simply an arrangement that made your life, gave it some sort of order that, that you might be able to get things to work well and smoothly in your home and family until the day would come when the burdens would be gone and you could focus on yourself and your dreams and what you wanted to do. And all the while, unbeknownst to you, you were drifting ever so slowly from the moorings of Christ. Sinclair Ferguson some years ago was speaking on the West Coast at, at a university and a, a seminary. Biola U. It used to be known as the Bible Institute of Los Angeles. That's how it developed its name. Some of the people, the benefactors to that school were great Hollywood magnates. And uh, um, they owned uh, just a few blocks, Sinclair said, uh, said, away from the campus, literally walking distance, a whole town, a whole set, movie set that was a town. And so the dean of the school, after that Friday he'd finished his speaking, the dean of the school had asked him, he said, we've got a group of people who want to take a tour in, in the old movie set. To, would, would you like to go see it? And he said, well, sure, yeah. And he said he went down and he said it was, it was just fascinating. He, he said he saw th there was Clint Eastwood's car from Dirty Harry. There was the vehicle from the Raiders of the Lost Ark. And he said th th there was even the old tank of, of, of Arnold Schwarzenegger, when, a tank that he drove when he was in the Austrian army. A and the, 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 the dean said that, that uh, f fairly often that, that Arnold Schwarzenegger would, would still come out and get in that old tank and fire it up and roll it around. But then Sinclair says, but even better than that, he said, was all those movies I grew up watching as a little boy, those, those cowboy movies, those westerns and those shootouts. And he said, there it was. You, you saw the saloon. You saw the undertaker's room. You saw, you saw the blacksmith's shop. And, and there you saw the balcony where, where so-and-so shot, was shot and fell off and tumbled down into that street. He said, oh, it was so fun. He said, it was so neat. But none of it was real. And he said, later on, he began to think, could, could my Christian life be like that at the end of the day? Could it be that, that one day my heart beat so loud for Christ, but now I'm up and coming and life has gotten on and could it be drift and neglect? Could it be that way for you? You can remember a time when your heart beat so much brighter for God. But I know life gets in the way. Your family's growing. Life is hopping. Work is busy. Inflation's biting your buckles. A 
And one day you wake up. And no longer the things of God shine for you. See how slow as in his screw tape letters. It's that book where one demon gives advice to another demon on how to trap people in the church. Lewis said it was the scariest book he's ever written because he, he could do it so easily it frightened him. The demon says the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope. It's soft underfoot, no sudden turns, no millstones, no signpost, just drifting along. And the writer tells us, pay. Pay attention to what you've heard by the help of God's Spirit. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, such sobering words. Could it be, could it be that some in here this day are drifting. By your grace, you've alarmed their heart. So in your mercies, continue your work, humbling until repentance, and then a heart renewed for you. And this is our prayer. In Christ, amen.